one. Hopefully you enjoyed lunch. My name is Scarlett Sieber. I am Managing Director at Catalyst Consulting Group. And we have an incredible afternoon uh, ahead of us. To start, we have a group of amazing venture capitalists looking at basically the future of and what is deep tech. Who here knows what deep tech is by a raise of hands? Perfect. Well, this is going to be a learning experience for all of you then. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, perspectives from many different people, and it's going to be great. There is really no precise definition. They'll each give you their viewpoint. So without further ado, let's bring the panel on up. We have Pedro, who is our moderator. And then with him, we have Ernest, Alex, Borja, Hussein, and Javier. Let's give them a round of applause. Everyone, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, guys. Well, my name is Pedro. I am going to be very quick uh, about me. I am co-founder of a startup, of a travel tech startup. It's called Minube. I also was working for Microsoft as the startup guy for, for the company here in Spain. And I am not an uh, investor like the rest of the people on this table. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but a little bit quick, because we have a uh, very short time. So please. Right, so just me, uh, Ernest Sanchez, and I'm part of Neco Capital. We are a venture capital firm based out in Barcelona with offices in London and Madrid. We invest in uh, different verticals, but we are with an edge in, uh, in deep tech, not very deep, but uh, we, <laughs> we want to touch it a little bit. And I have a past where I invested in Israel in sort of uh, deep, deep tech companies. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Alex. I work for Caphorn. We're a VC fund based out of Paris, France. Uh, we have 180 million under management, and we invest uh, only B2B tech, sometimes deep, sometimes less deep, but uh, that's the B2B tech is our, is our motto. Hi, uh, Hussein. I work for an early stage venture fund in London called Hoxton. Uh, we do uh, all kinds of things, everything from consumer to B2B to deep tech. Uh, we're kind of all over the place. If we think a company can scale up to be a multi-billion dollar company from Europe, we want to be investors. Hi, my name is uh, Borja Breña. I am an investment manager at Nauta Capital. We are a European VC with offices in uh, London, Munich, and Barcelona. And we invest in um, software companies, usually B2B SaaS. Um, and some of them are obviously deep tech, and other ones are a bit shallower. But uh, again, like who's saying, we want to be investors in in, uh, in, the, in the large uh, software plays that are going to come out of Europe in the, in the next few years. So Javier Urecia from Bullnet Capital. We are a VC fund based here in Spain. We invest in Spanish deep tech companies, and uh, we are investing since uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, we are running our third fund. and. Uh, trying to raise a fourth one. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm the only one really investing in deep tech here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's why I think that the first one to answer the first question is you, Javier, because you know we're talking about deep tech, but we asked you before, and you didn't raise your hand about what is deep tech. And the truth is that I think deep tech right now is like a label. So it's not a great, a, a concrete, you know, a, a precise thing. And I think that each one of us have a real personal opinion on that. So I think the first one, Javier, please, can you tell us what is for you deep tech? What, are, what have these startups for you to invest in them? Well, so the, the business model uh, is based on a differential technology. So uh, these are companies that come, most of them, from uh, universities or from uh, research centers. There is a lot of research. There is a lot of uh, proper intellectual property. Um, the founders are uh, scientists or people with uh, huge uh, technological experience, and um, and as I said, they are more I mean B two B, so they are selling to other companies, and um, well, we are investing in software, but software complex software. I'm not talking about applications or add-ons or uh, uh, um, uh, light layers of software that are uh, allowing uh, services. We are talking about semiconductors. We are talking about optoelectronics. Uh, electronics with uh, uh, software embedded, um, so really things that are uh, very difficult to replicate. It's not that the business model is very original, it's that there are a lot of uh, years of uh, research behind the, uh, the company. Okay, thank you. Borja, your opinion on that? 
So that does the definition of deep tech. Um, the question is that deep tech changes over the time. So back in the time, a simple ballpin was deep tech. Nowadays, obviously, deep tech is something like semiconductors or even farther blockchain, biotechnology, you name it. So what one considers deep tech today might change and in 10 years time something different. So that's why we can defer. And when we see an investment opportunity, you might not see deep tech or might see some deep tech in it. Okay, so, uh, and there's another thing that I could say is I totally agree with what, what, what Javier said, okay? So there's commercial innovation, there is technical product innovation. When it's really far, you know, and the innovation uh, and the technical product side becomes an actual moat, you can consider it deep tech, but you can either make it because of one specific feature that you're actually making it really far and advanced and basically give you two, three years or even more um, ahead of the competition or that you can combine different features of technology that in, in all, all in all, gives you, you know, ahead of the start of two, three, four, five years ahead of the competition. So it could be different features adding up to deep tech. Okay, thanks. Hussein, your call. Yeah, I mean, not, not much to add. I would say deep tech are things which are very R&D centric and where the IP is kind of the key distinguishing factor of the company. Uh, and they're usually working on something pretty novel. Um, so that, that would be kind of my definition. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I guess we all have a different definition here. And I was asking my, my uh, co-partners in the, fu in the fund, and they were saying we all had a different view on it. I guess you know, I go alongside what you guys were saying. It's really, it really hinges on the, the quality of the technology behind the mode that it creates for anyone to try and copy. It's typically the barrier to entry. And at the time of investment as an investor, I'd consider something deep tech because what I value the most and what I think the market will value the most is the technology at the heart of the product versus what we call more of an execution deal where it's really the go-to-market, the brand, and how you, how you tackle the market, how you accelerate your growth, that creates the moat. Okay. Well, uh, Ernest, please. Is everything has been said, but <laughs> uh, I, I would say that, you know, technology-driven companies, because we're talking about companies who are investing, so actually, you know, what Javier was saying, it's uh, a lot of scientific, you know, doing things, but there is not just software, it's materials, it's engineering, it's biotechnology, so it's lots of things that, we can, we can just embed on, on deep tech. But uh, talking about investing, so I would like more to, to speak about you know, what kind of companies are subject to, mm -hmm. you know, to tackle one particular market using technology-driven uh, solutions. Okay, that's good. I think we can agree on impact as a main issue, you know, when you talk about deep tech, right? We are looking for, for impact on the society, and I guess we, are, we, are, we agree on that. So talking about investment, and you can be first, what are you looking for when you are when when you will <laughs> look for for a startup on deep tech? So well, actually, <clears throat> I mean the the problem when investing is uh, is the, the 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 period cycle. So uh, talking about deep tech and considering the the scientific cycle of of the process. So the funds we we've done uh, we exist to, to to last for ten years, say so, and. Um, during 10 years, you cannot validate a deep tech model unless you know it's in a proper way or in a proper moment when, mm -hmm. when you can actually invest. So we are a fund that we have to invest in Series A onwards. And in that case, you know, the, the technology has to be proven. So it's not in a, in a test mode, it's not a tech transfer, it's, a, it's something that is out of the university and became a business actually. So at that point, we look for companies that the, the economics could exist because in the end we have to provide um, returns. So that's uh, something meaningful. But in the end, you know, when talking uh, when talking on deep tech companies, we need companies that create impact that they can change, you know, from the root, and then the applications can be multiple things that on the on the B two B side can be applied on different sectors, verticals, and industries. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I have a similar problem because I invest Series A, Series B. Usually, it's about accelerating go to market. The, the deep tech investments we've done are when we do seed and occasionally we do that. And for example, we've done it in Ledger uh, and when it was about you know, a digital wallet to protect your, your, your crypto assets, at the time when we invested in seed, it was quite novel uh, and we considered it to be quite deep tech. The same goes with uh, companies we invested in in deep learning like GreenQuark. Uh, you know, we invested in seed and at the time there was no such thing as a proper product and a go-to-market strategy. Turns out it's, it's actually starting to work, but it takes longer time. And I guess as an investor, the way I look at it is uh, I have a fund, you know, I have to invest it within two, three, up to four years, and then I've got up to 10 years to divest. So I need to have a clear view of what I'm gonna do with the company. Um, and clearly when I look at deep tech, I need to somehow understand what this is about. And 
oftentimes it's really difficult. So I won't look at optronics and things like that, uh, silicon, because this is not my training. Uh, and I guess that's one of the barriers to deep tech is you need to understand and be able to challenge what you have in front of you because, yeah, a bunch of patterns can be good, but I need to be able to understand. So some things I understand and I can go in. Others we just pass for lack of understanding of you know, the, the underlying technology and the edge and the moat. Do you want to add something, or maybe I can? So I yeah, want let me one, okay. one thing. Yeah, um, we, we um, what we are you ask what we are looking when we uh, no. Yeah. So the first thing is the team. So the founding team, we they have to have experience and background on uh, really uh, many years of experience on their on their field. And the second is uh, we try to really understand ourselves, not uh, looking uh, or asking to uh, external people, but ourselves, the technology and the competitiveness. Yeah. So we spend months uh, doing the technological due diligence. We are a small team of four people, uh, four engineers. Uh, three of them, they are really very knowledge on, on technology and software and electronics. So uh, uh, for us, it's key to really uh, understand the same language and talk the same language than the, than the entrepreneurs. That is quite interesting, Javier, because you know one of the main pains everyone talks when they talk about investing in deep, uh, in deep tech is about the difficulty to understand the technology. And they even say that if you don't have a PhD on your team, it's not easy for you to understand the technology. You know? uh, at the same time, when we talk about uh, this deep technology, uh, we are used to think about the science fiction, right? About the things that we've learned from the books of Julio Verne or, or Asimov or about the, the movies. And it's uh, sometimes complicated to understand exactly how it lands to a, to a real space, right? So how do you guys, do you think you can fight the hype? You know, it's sometimes that we can be uh, very illusional about some new brand technology, but, and, and we don't really understand exactly what it is. So it becomes a great hype. So it's a lot of people trying to invest in something, but they don't know uh, exactly how to do it. Uh, for, for instance, we're saying, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that much of the deep tech world actually gets hyped because the, the, the virtue of, not, of people not being able to understand it means it doesn't end up in kind of the mainstream press in the same way. Um, so, so it is actually genuinely you know, difficult to understand some of these kind of core innovations. Um, so the, the big question for us is it's not just usually the R&D value or the intellectual property value of the company that makes these things interesting. They, they have to figure out a way to, to get into market. And I, I would argue that you spend just as many cycles once you kind of can kind of suspend disbelief and believe they can, they can build whatever it is that they say they're going to build, where you think that there's a mechanism to be able to scale the business. I mean, the advantages of kind of you know, consumer businesses is you know, the data kind of tells you immediately whether something is scaling or not. The challenge with deep tech businesses is you kind of have to incubate them or gestate them for like two, three years because they have to go do the actual hard work. But you can't write the check at least we don't feel comfortable writing the check when all there is is the IP. We really do have to think about what the next step is going to be. Can this, and, and you know, the classic old companies, I mean, people forget this. Like back in the day when Intel was like a chip company doing memory chips, not even like processor chips, the ramp up to like to real revenue, like 50 to 100 million in revenue happened incredibly fast. Genentech did exactly the same thing. So once these things actually do get kind of product market fit, they build what they say they're going to build. The, the really great businesses of, 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 of what we've seen and kind of like hard technology, deep technology, scale really, really, really la rapidly. Okay. Borja, you want to add something? Absolutely. So I totally agree with uh, what Hussein is saying. I mean, technological advances, obviously, uh, <clears throat> long term, and probably when you're on the R&D side and the technical risk is high or very high, that, that would not be a VC play. Um, that would be more like a university, so uh, research uh, centers. Uh, what we, we usually invest in is when you see some technological advance that can give uh, some creation of value. But the problem we see is that they're usually developers who are very much focused on the technology, and they really love tech, and they're really good at that, and they know that. Probably I don't even understand what they are trying to build. But what I, uh, I rather look at is, is, is actually a market out there that is going to buy this, or is, it, is the market ripe? So it takes actually even longer to find the right time to invest just before the market is really asking for that. Because if you go to any inventions fair, they're full of new inventions, but not most, I mean, most of them don't even make money. 
Um, so the question here is when I do see something which is meaningfully a deep tech, is it, is it ready to actually make an impact and create value in the next few years? When that happens, it's boom, it's overnight. What happens is that it's not overnight, it's from day zero. You know, maybe I've been looking at those companies for, you know, maybe I, I learn about them today, and only in five years' time is when I invest. When I think that it's one, two years before, you know, they can, they can get to market. Um, so what I would say to the technical founders that focus on deep tech is that they need to think about the commercial side of it. Not just to make money, it's just to understand whether what they're creating is adding value to mankind, which is not something that you say, something everybody says by buying, or something that increases value only to their ego, okay, which is uh, totally worthless. So I want to invest in something that adds value and retains it and captures it for mankind, rather than ego, you know, for some sort of tenure professor in some, you know, uh, university. I, I, I'm not interested in that. Okay, thanks. They say also that one of the main pains of, of deep tech uh, when you are going to invest is they are slow, right? Because they need everything you say. Javier, you have been investing on 20 years. Uh, are they slow? Well, our oldest company in the portfolio is 14 years old. Uh, we sold the first one in three years. So, I mean, it depends on, on the cases. But yes, you have to be very patient. And uh, you know that the window of opportunity of uh, selling the company is uh, years from, from, day, from day one. And uh, well, if you have LPs that accept uh, that and that you are uh, used to this and that you are not uh, looking for an exit uh, in, in, the, in the third year, uh, it happens. Of course, I would like to sell all the companies in the third year uh, the maximum value, but uh, we know that in this case, companies, you don't, you don't sell the companies, the companies are bought by someone. So at the end, you have to wait until the right opportunity, the right uh, buyer is there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very long, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's a lot of research. So yeah. before you have products in the market and the market is ready to buy them and uh, you are uh, scaling, uh, it takes a lot of time. Great. And, and because all, all of that, because all of that research, they say also that they fail more often. Uh, what do you think on that? Is that, is that true? Do you think it's that you take more risk investing in this kind of company because of that, for instance, Alex? It's hard to tell. I mean, I, I couldn't speak for our portfolio because actually our deep tech companies are quite successful, uh, and we don't have we only have a few in the portfolio, and, and they're quite successful. So, uh, obviously, if you take them very young and they're still doing R and D, the big question for us is to assess their ability to uh, transform a technology into a product. And oftentimes, it's very much so the case in France. I guess it's quite a European pattern where. We are we love technology, and it's really about you know having the best technology, uh, but we don't think we think about the technology even before the product. And in the end, for me, when I ask the question, is okay, uh, you have this technology, but what's the product, and what problem does it solve, and whose problem is it in the end? And for founders that have that mindset, you know, they can be uh, PhDs, ten years of math, and doing you know uh, lots of R and D in universities. If they have that mindset. I guess you're much more likely to uh, to, to find a uh, to find a, a, a good business. Uh, it, it really hinges on the f like any business. It really hinges on the founder's culture. Mm. I, I, I mean, the mortality is unavoidable. I mean, companies are going <laughs> to die. That's for sure. Of course. Uh, there are many uh, models of investing. Uh, you can try to. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to invest in a lot of companies because I know that 10% or 15% or 20% are going to give me back uh, uh, the returns and the rest are going to either die or are going to be zombies or uh, we are going to uh, recover only a small part of the investment. We have a completely uh, opposite approach. We invest in a very uh, few amount of uh, companies. We have invested in 19 years in 18 companies. So. Uh, Mortality, low mortality is one of our main uh, objectives. And uh, when you invest in these type of companies where the, the period is uh, so long, where the efficiency on the use of the capital is very high, you are not using money to acquire customers, or you're not using money for marketing uh, uh, campaigns or whatever. You're using money to pay people in the software cases or to pay people and do some prototypes. In, so you can, uh, with uh, relatively small amount of money, you can really uh, um, uh, stay a long time. You have a lot of subsidies, you have a lot of uh, uh, R&D support. So 
Um, I don't think that this, uh, I mean, I, I haven't invested on uh, non-deep uh, tech uh, companies, so I, don't, I can't compare, but the three companies that died from our portfolio were the less deep of the, okay. of the 18. Uh. I, I don't think that deep tech companies have higher mortality rate than the usual VC play. And uh, the thing that I see two main reasons. Number one is that the failure usually happens before the VC goes in. So the, it happens at R&D stage. So there are thousands of universities out there you know, researching specific lines. And then you know, after two, three years, they find out that you know, it really doesn't get anywhere. So those uh, failures have not been invested by VCs, usually by you know, uh, R&D funding. <clears throat> when something goes like something, you know, it seems that it's going to work, then, may, then maybe a VC can see, like uh, Javier says, the potential. Then obviously, then you start investing, and then onwards, the probability ratio of success or failure actually is similar to any other VC play. The second thing is because they're very technical, uh, they don't have this hype, as Hussein was saying, they don't appear on uh, the big mag magazines, and they don't receive 50 million just to acquire customers. Uh, they receive money to actually prove, uh, you know, uh, to validate their hypothesis little by little. So because they don't have so much money, they actually don't, you know, doesn't burn their hands so they don't fail. They only fail when their technology doesn't work, right? But, uh, but it's not because they basically get overloaded with cash. They get the cash in 50, 100, 500 million when they actually need it because they need, you know, that money to really put, you know, put it to, to good use. Um, you know, to either build the hardware or build it, whatever it is that, that they're, they're doing, right? Um, but they, they're not just misusing the money for just acquiring customers, paying for your own customers, all right? Okay, you know, just for being the devil advocate here and talking about what you just said, what do you think about this Terranos effect? You know, Terranos, this company that did exactly the upside that you said. And uh, that's why I'm selling the devil advocate, right? Is it this company that just, just uh, used a lot of marketing stuff? He, they were huge. This, uh, this lady the entrepreneur, uh, this, she said that she was trying to change the world. And at the end of the time, it was a fake. And well, if you can see a Netflix documentary right now, you can, you can check the whole it wasn't, story. It so. wasn't venture backed. Sorry? It wasn't yeah. venture backed. Mm -hmm. There was no venture person on the board. There were no venture firms in the cap table apart from like one or two VCs who did it as kind of angel investments. So it was, it was, it was a bunch of rich families who didn't know what they were doing trying to play tech VC. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. What I'm saying is exactly this is, uh, do you think this kind of effect can really hurt this uh, investment or this ecosystem on DeepEd? Because you know, it's, it's something that people saw and they don't understand these kind of small things. And you know that when you tell a, a uh, story like this one, people just take the things they want to take, right? Mm -hmm. So you think it's going to be a bad thing for the, for the ecosystem? I would like to say something about that. Yeah, yeah, I was at Tiranos, you know, they, they just came directly straight away to the B2C. They, they wanted just to address the market, and it was, they didn't cross the bridge. So it was lots of regulations in between. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, if you work on um, Sanobiel fluid, for instance, you know, and you wanna you wanna you wanna change, you know, how the people replace themselves from something problems on their needs or, you know, on a prothesis. So you will you will find ahead of you, you know, lots of regulations. So you cannot just go and, and just jump everything and go go straight to the market. So as Javier was saying, you know, it's a scientific process. There's lots of university transfer. There's lots of time to evaluate to validate this this business model, and then eventually it will become a company. And then when it, it is a company, but I mean, it's yeah. not a company as we understand, you know, on the, on the, on the economic units and, and producing money as we think when it has to be invested and it would produce some returns. So reaching that point, to me, it's, uh, well, the Tadano's uh, seven, 700 million burns, it was, yeah, it was something like that. So it was something that they, they just created the product, jumped to the market, and it was nothing there. Yeah, yeah of course. And so the point is that we are talking about deep technology, people that is trying to change for real the world. So we have a lot of opportunities, right? It's uh, maybe they say also that I was just talking about the pains, but there's a lot of good thought on the on this industry. And they say they could be the next blue ocean, right? Because there are not so many people investing in these areas. There's a lot of people on consumer side or on SaaS platforms. So what do you think about that? Maybe uh, you as uh, investors, when you invest in deep tech, you usually go at the beginning of the company, so you can have a, maybe a lot of, of, of equity of the company, and at the same time, 
the returns are maybe bigger than in the other side. So Hussein, uh, what do you think about that? We're, we're only a seed and series A firm, so whether we do a consumer tech or a business to business business or a deep tech type business, we're, we're almost always the first venture investor um, behind them. Uh, sometimes we're a very large venture investor and we've done things with a sheet of paper with two people and written a $5 million check on the basis of an idea, but, but, it, but we're, we're, we're always early. Okay. Alex, do you think there are a lot of opportunities on, on DeepTech right now? Yeah, of course there is, uh, and you know, just like there is on less deep tech, I think the we try and go. We'll, you know, we're, we're, no, we're known for going after "quote unquote" unsexy startups, and uh, typically what you see with the inflation evaluation, as an investor, at some point I got I to gotta make sure I'm not getting uh, stuck in that uh, in that trap. And uh, what you see with the "quote unquote" unsexy startups, very tech driven, uh, you know, not no fluff, no marketing, no nothing. Uh, tend to be less attractive to the, the crowd of investors that you have nowadays, and it basically allows you to have, uh, you know, better conversations with <laughs> your be better understanding of what the company does, and it's, it becomes somewhat less competitive. So, um, going back to Ledger, when they were looking for a seed, we went in, and it was a big bet. At COE's B stage, they were skyrocketing their revenues; they were exceeding, they, they were doubling, they, they were doubling month over month. It was completely crazy and they attracted an awful lot of money. Uh, so it was a great deal for us, a great deal for them as well. Um, so to me, th there's no rule. The rule is, you know, make sure you invest in the <laughs> right kind of company for the right problem, the right product, the right business, uh, and the right people. Mm -hmm. That's cool. We only have a couple of minutes left, so Javier, just to finish, can you tell us some good example of your portfolio in these 20 years about a deep tech company? Yes, well, a company based in Sevilla, which is not the place that uh, some, I mean, every, everyone thinks uh, when uh, talking about deep tech. Uh, a spin-off from CSIC, which is the official uh, research center in Spain, the first spin-off uh, ever, and we invested in 2003. So we uh, helped to create the company. It was a semiconductor company specialized on uh, image uh, sensors, a company founded by seven uh, researchers. Uh, um, we spent 11 years, uh, they fought each other every other day, so we had to really be uh, the, some arbitrage, and this company was bought by a company called E2B, it's a British company specialized in semiconductors, and then the company was bought by Teledyne, which is one of the monsters of the electronics uh, in, in, in the world, a US company, and now uh, they have uh, created in Sevilla, based on that team, uh, a research uh, excellence center for image sensors, so um, we made uh, very good returns. All the team had uh, stock options or phantom shares. Uh, all the public money uh, was uh, given back with uh, uh, the returns that were expected. And, uh, and now we have a multinational in Andalusia on a place where uh, there is a lot of uh, toros uh, and uh, feria, but not many semiconductor companies uh, who is investing there and hiring engineers. So. That's uh, the paradigm of what we will want to, to do and what we are doing. I mean, we have um, some examples similar to this. Okay, that's really cool. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the session as I did. Thank you, Ernest, Alex, Hussein, Borja, and Javier. And thank you all for being here. We'll leave you with the next session. Thank you very much. Yeah.